Hi, I'm Nicola. And I'm Darren. And we are from Nutrisoil. We are part of a team whose purpose is to empower farmers to produce life-enriching food. Here at Nutrisoil, we produce a unique worm liquid which farmers use to coat their seed in furrow and as a foliar application. This in turn increases the light capture of plants and the abundance and diversity of life in the soil. Food grown in this system has higher nutrient integrity, uses less fertiliser and has a less chemical load, which is healthy for humans and the earth. We're thrilled to be silver sponsors of the National Regenerative Agricultural Day, celebrating sacred regeneration of the earth. Hello everybody and welcome to our hearty Regenerate podcast. We've got a beautiful lineup of people today. And the theme of our podcast today is called Drumroll. <laughs> <laughs> we are speaking on the need to read the weed. Uh, we're very pleased to have Stuart, Stuart and Stuart Peters. <laughs> Can we start again, Biggie? You're so funny. Hello everyone and welcome to our very hearty podcast today and we're just leading up to our National Regenerative Agriculture Day, Farmers and Foodies Hijacking Valentine's Day and we're really super pleased to have Peter Andrews with us and Mike McCosker. Now those of you who don't know, Peter Andrews is from Tarwin Park and he's the one of the gurus from Natural Sequence Farming. So we're really pleased to have you. Hello, Stuart. How are you today? I'm um, good, thanks, Helen. How are you? Great to see you. And also we've got Mike here. Um, Mike is Mike McCosker. Um, and I'd really love to hear from you, Mike, about your story and, and sharing your story around, you know, what, 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 what it was that changed the way that you did your farming practices. Yeah, um, I guess if we go back 30 years, because I'm getting old enough that I can go back 30 years, I started as a chemical farmer and Dad and I working together um, you know, we were following everything that the DPI told us made us the, the best farmers we could be at that point in time. We were doing our own sort of on-farm trials with different fertiliser rates and different chemicals. And um, I guess we got to a point where I sort of went, you know, we're meant to be the best farmers in the district. We're doing everything we're told to do to be the best farmers, and yet we don't have the best crops all the time. Next door, we had very traditional farmers that used to farm the, the country, you know, 10, 12 times between crops. And uh, we had one really wet winter where they actually had great crops and we had horrible crops. And I started to talk to Dad and say, well, you know, what's going on here? So started to look at other, other things. And at that point in time, came in contact with Arden Anderson and Arden was teaching biological farming. Now, what was really interesting was about the same point in time, I actually had a chemical poisoning event. And the solution to my health problem actually became a, a change in diet. So I got sick with the chemicals and my thyroid collapsed. And the doctor sort of got me back to about maybe 70% health. You know, I had great days and terrible days. And... Um, when I started to listen to, to Arden and he was talking about how we grow our food and how important that is for, you know, the quality of that food. And at the same time, on, the other, on my own personal journey, I found that when I changed my diet, I went from 70% health to 100% health in the space of three, four weeks. And so that was a real um, awakening for me 
where I went, hold on, I've really got to question everything that I've been doing because I'm now learning that there's a different way to, to view nature, um, that there's processes going on in nature that, that actually work for us and yet here we are spending our whole time trying to, to you know, kill things and, and set up a, a, a crop that, you know, just one plant out of many that could be growing there. So it was a really interesting journey for me. Uh, and in the 30 years since that happened, it's, it's been a continual learning process to discover what it means to, to actually come into alignment with nature instead of being fighting against nature. Kelly, I'm going to bring you in because um, it's really interesting. You and I are always doing the asking questions of everyone. I'm actually going to throw something to you <laughs> and, and ask you what was your journey and how you started with regenerative agriculture because I think everyone's really interested to hear that. Not many people know your story. Yeah, <laughs> well, I was, <laughs> I was a tree changer from Melbourne, actually. I came, um, I came up to the area that, where Mike and Helen live and bought a little a little hobby farm and yeah I mean plowed along and turned it into a community space so I, my focus was on how do we sort of like bring that community environment to the middle of nowhere and so I set up a bush cinema and we used to I used to screen documentaries basically once a month and um, cook homemade breads and soups and grow the vegetables for the soup and um, started to invite a community to attend those who are interested sort of in alternative thoughts and topics and in doing that generated an audience who sort of had never met each other, um, tended not to sort of be the pub goers and didn't really have a, another place to connect. Sort of in one night on the first night, we did a, <laughs> we did a crystal bowl meditation. I, can, I know that's a bit woohoo for our farmers, but we did a crystal bowl meditation and um, it was on a Wednesday night in the middle of winter terrible terrible time to organize an event and um you know like 50 60 people turned up and in one night a community literally met each other who had all been sort of scattered around the region kind of like in an hour and a half around my little hobby farm and they all sort of turned up on one night and connected and a community sort of formed in my backyard and we went from there and so that's how I met Helen and Mike, actually, and um, as we sort of continued on through the years and the community grew and we sort of got into, I was very obsessed with alternative building and how to basically build this space using, like, very minimal resources, just what we could find on the ground or in the forest or at our local tip, which, as everyone here would know, is akin to our local Bunnings, and um, <clears throat> built this space. And then, of course, the drought hit uh, in 2017 and, when that hit and everything just sort of started dying around us, it was very much like an apocalyptic event, you know, watching these, watching first of all, all your hard work in the vegetable garden and then your fruit trees and then suddenly your animals didn't have enough food and having to deal with what that meant. And it was a real, real life changing event for me. And, um, and then obviously watching the communities collapse and the the pubs close and the schools close and the local stores close and then your bigger trees starting to die and then the riverways drying up and all of that sort of took place in front of my eyes in a, a three-year period and um, and that's when Mike, Helen and I sat down and said, well, what is drought? How did how does drought even happen? Like what what is the mechanism behind this? Does it have to be a part of Australia's story forever? We just accept it as being part of Australia but we actually like dug in there and really wanted to examine how we could actually contribute our skills at that time um, to helping Australia get out of this drought. And of course, the answer is in regenerative agriculture and it is in healing the soil and it is in healing our waterways and riverways. And that was the beginning of a massive amount of new information for me, sort of, I mean, I feel like I did a master's degree unexpectedly in, <laughs> in understanding our natural environment. And that, of course, gave birth to Carbonate and the National Region Ag Day. And, and eventually, here we are in 2021 with Regenerate, the podcast. So that's how I entered the situation. So for me, every time we meet these amazing guests like Stuart, it's such a privilege because, you know, we've been watching and reading and, and putting all the pieces together sort of in our home offices. So, you know, it's really wonderful and, and an honour to be in connection with sort of the founding 
um, community leaders in this space. So, Stuart, thank you so much for being on. So, I'm fascinated. Tell us about your, stu- your story, Stuart, how you ended up where you are today and what's led you to this moment in time. Well, I, I guess in some ways I probably wasn't given a whole lot of choice. I, um, I, I grew, grew up in this, my father, Peter Andrews, who a lot of people know of, um, had this ability to look at the landscape in a, in a way that nobody, well, at least people around this time have not been able to do. Um, and so I grew up with him while he was learning. Now, I don't know whether anyone's had to be around someone to try and learn while they're learning. It's very difficult. And when you are a pioneer and not necessarily very good at distributing a message clear and cleanly, it is very hard for those who are trying to learn at the same time. So there was a considerable amount of friction, I guess you'd say, between PA and I uh, growing up. So things were tense, life was difficult, um, finances were poor and um, all of those things. Um, so I guess in some ways it probably restricted my ability to learn for quite some time and this would be not a story different to a lot of farmers out there that have you know, been in a farming business and, and Dad's been running it for the last 50 years and son's now 50 or 60 and still waiting for a shot. You know, this is the same story around and around. But it was only through circumstance because of PA's uh, doggedness at wanting to get this information out um, that, you know, he, his concentration on the, on the core business, the financial side of our business was let go. And so he, he found that um, or we found that, the, that he couldn't no longer keep the finances going for the bank. So the, the bank decided that they would, the only thing they could do was to foreclose on us. So that brought Megan, my wife, and I into the fray where um, I could see that if I didn't do something, we would lose Tarwan Park, which was the core behind PA's work. So we went out on a limb and uh, keep in mind that I'd always worked on the farm, never actually earned a, a living. So I don't know whether anyone's been to a bank to try and get finances when you've got nothing behind you. It is, it's rather challenging, I could say. Anyway, we somehow, I don't know, so the universe was on our side. Uh, we managed to achieve it. Uh, PA was not exactly the most uh, receiving person to allow that to happen. But anyway, it, we got through it. And that's really where my journey started. This is the thing, you know, that in I'll talk about our training program as we go through, but part of our ability to learn is that we need to be out there doing it. Otherwise, it makes it very difficult to learn. So all the time that I spent with PA, I, 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 could, I could look back and say, well, I don't know that I necessarily learned anything, but I'm sure I did. It was just going into the vault in my head but I could never actually do anything with it because he wouldn't let me do anything with it. So once Megan and I had to take over the farm, now it was up to me. One of the parting words of PA, because he, he is a pioneer and he can be a little bit grumpy at times, he said to me, he said, you will F this up in two years. I went, well, thanks for the encouragement, PA. Fantastic. I will, I will move forward and, and let's see what happens. Well, See, it just so happens that there's a, there are a few crossovers between PA and I, and the one part, one of the parts that I got was stubbornness and a, and a desire not to be proven wrong. So, you know, I took that and I ran with it, and I value it, all the work that he did on Tower Park and everything that he's done so that, you know, it forced me to, to understand clearly what I'd been taught over those years of working with him more more just through following and watching. Um, but it, it became more key then because I had to actually do it. So I had to use my observation skills like he used his to understand what it was that he was doing and why and so forth. So, you know, I, I guess really that was in 1999. I was only, I think I was 28. So I was probably, for a lot of farmers, I was probably fairly young to take over from their dad. Most of them would be still, you know, waiting at the age of 50 to get a shot. But, you know, through circumstance, I was pushed in there early. I believe that that was the universe trying to drive NSF forward. And so, and that was my role to try and help drive that, 
drive that forward and support PA and what he was trying to achieve. In So we ran the farm, so for about, uh, what was it, from 1999 to 2012, we, we ran the farm as a, as a beef cattle trading enterprise. In the, in the time, we were upgrading the NSF infrastructure and, you know, understanding, trying to understand as much as I could about, you know, all that information that it was locked in my, been locked in my head for the last 20 or 30 years. So in, uh, during that period of time, the first Australian story came out with PA on, which a lot of people saw. It was um, still holds a record as a number of viewers that watched it. Uh, a fellow by the name of Dwayne Norris signed up to be PA's PA, his personal assistant. And Dwayne worked with PA for about seven years trying to help get this information out. And during that time, he wanted to get a training program up but through different circumstances, they weren't able to achieve it. Anyway, Dwayne decided after seven years of working with PA, which I must admit is a record, I think apart from me, there's nobody else that would beat Dwayne in the length of time that they've spent with PA in direct contact. He is a, he's a fairly heavy unit to be around for a long period of time. And so Dwayne, he was, he, he's been able to stick it out the longest, but he decided then, I think for his own mental health, he, would, he had to do something else because he, he just couldn't make anything work any further. So I went to him and said, Dwayne, you wanted to get that training program up, let's do it. Now, a number of things had to happen for that. I had to feel that I had something to offer to other people. And I had to have the confidence to go out and stand in front of a group of people and deliver this information. I believed I had reached that stage. So I said to Dwayne, let's do it. No idea how to go about it. I don't know how to run a training program. I'm a farmer. But let's just do it. Let's, we've got no money. We'll just start doing it. So we did. We, uh, between uh, Dwayne and Gwyn and myself, we sat down and we, we built this training program. It was, it's, you know, it was pretty simple, um, a pretty simple format. Uh, it's about teaching people to read the landscape. So in 2012, I think it was May 2012, we ran our first training program. And from there, it's gradually grown. And, you know, I think along the way that that's helped because the information that we deliver is PA's information that he gauged from the Australian landscape. It's not his way of farming or anything. It's got to do with the Australian landscape. So his um, work pad, his, his map, is the Australian landscape. He was able to see how that functioned without humans being involved and then understand how can we uh, al allow that landscape to still function the same way and yet conduct our farming practices. And so we then simplified that his information down into um, chunks that people could understand. And so, yeah, here we are today. We started in, in that first year, I think we ran two courses the first course, we got about, I think we got 12 people attend it. I think the second one in that year, we had about eight people attend it. Uh, so that was 2012. Last year, we had 20 courses um, listed down. COVID obviously put pay to a, quite a number of those. This year, we have 17 courses listed down. And, you know, some of that, we have a maximum of 20 people attending the courses. Um, and so we, we, you know, we, 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 we don't always fill them, but we certainly get greater numbers than what we did before. So this whole regenerative uh, farming field is growing, which is, a, which is fantastic. And um, for us to be able to get the information that PA has been able to, to, to gauge out of the landscape out in a clear, concise way, I think is, is critical. So that's, that's only just a small piece of my journey to give you a bit of an idea as to where I came from i am still farming today we run a farming business up in in queensland outside of gympie we have pastured uh, chickens for eggs we have pastured chicken meat birds we have uh, grass-fed lamb we have pastured pork and we have uh, uh, cattle grass-fed cattle we're not selling the, the beef as grass-fed beef we just use them as tools like everything else so yeah, it's, um, it's pretty full on um, i would probably suggest that i've bitten off far more than i can chew but anyhow, that's pretty traditional with the Andrews. 
Thanks, Stuart. And I think it's probably pretty traditional with all farmers generally. We always bite off more than, than we can chew, and that's just part of being us, isn't it? I think yeah. so. Yeah, look, um, I was actually speaking, we were speaking yesterday together, and Stuart mentioned that he's got a great video, and we wanted to share it with you. And for those newbies out there, if anyone didn't know who PA, what PA is, PA is Peter Andrews. And NF, NSF is Natural Secrets Farming. So if I could just show you this wonderful video um, about the, about a little bit about your journey in NSF. Um, let it roll, thanks, Biggie. Well, I would say the key essence of natural sequence farming is plants were managing water. That's what built the landscape. So it's really key that people that are involved in regenerative agriculture start with plants and water and how plants are the engineers that build everything. And then all of the other things from their toolbox that they want to fit in there as part of their regenerative journey, that's fantastic because that will just help build the system. But you must start understanding how the landscape functions first and foremost. My name's Stuart Andrews from Tarn Park Training and we run training courses teaching people how to implement natural sequence farming into their landscape. The key component is about understanding how to read a landscape and how then to implement natural sequence farming, so increasing our productivity at the same time as building our environment. Tarwin Park Training started at the home property, the property where PA Peter Andrews did all of his trial work I guess on natural sequence farming and that's where I grew up and in 2012 we decided to start a training program to help deliver the information that he got out of the Australian landscape to people in a clear concise way and with practical components so they know how to go home and introduce that into their own landscapes. It's a learn by doing type course. The motto is Slow the flow, let all plants grow, be careful where the animals go, and filtration is a must know. Now what I say to people is if you can go out into your landscape and you can have that list with you, and you tick off every one of those things in everything that you do, then you are moving your landscape forward. In other words, you are aggrading your landscape. Once people realise how they can read the landscape, it really empowers you because you do come out of it with the attachment to the landscape. How you act from there is entirely up to you. What we offer in Tarwin Park Training is a complete package. We're looking at all of the functions that grew this landscape. We're not just taking a piece out where we're saying, oh, we're just going to rehydrate the landscape. Once we start talking about all plants and why those plants are important, it really is invigorating for people to go home and then look at their landscape and then work out their plan as to what they're going to do. When we started our first training program, there was PA, there was myself, there was Dwayne Norris and Gwyn Jones. And on our name tags, I had PA listed down as an African boxhorn. We all know that an African boxhorn is a pretty prickly plant. And so PA is that primary coloniser. He's the, the pioneer that comes in to start everything and he's doing the best he can. Then it's time for the next plant. So I put myself in there and said that I was a blackberry. So still prickly, but not quite as prickly as the African boxhorn. And then Dwayne, who was a lot less prickly, he was a willow tree. And then Gwyn was a native grass. And it's no different to plants. To start with a primary coloniser, it builds the landscape for the next, and then it builds the landscape for the next, and you end up with grass. That's how it works. So if I ever become the prickly one, then I have to make sure that there's someone less prickly to follow me up. That's how it goes. As a family, we have been through a lot. And probably the easiest thing to do would have been just to forget about all this stuff because it would have been a lot easier. There's been so much heartache. But PA has some information that is really, really special. And that I considered that it was worthwhile getting that information out and I have two boys and they, along with all the other kids of the world, deserve to have a better environment. And they will come in and take over from me. That's a succession. That's how these things happen. And then there's all the people that we're training. All those guys are training their friends, their neighbours, 
and that's how this message gets out. That's how we can make a change. So that was a beautiful snapshot around natural sequence farming and uh, I'm really excited to have Gwyn Jones on our um, on our podcast today. We've now got two Joneses and two McCoskers. <laughs> Stuart, don't you feel left out? <laughs> and Gwyn has actually been working in the natural sequence farming space for some time. Hello, Gwyn. Lovely to have you on our podcast, our hearty Regenerate podcast. Thank you for letting me come in. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask you, you know, we've, we've just had a little, uh, a beautiful conversation with Mike and Stuart around what was the thing that, you know, helped, you know, what's your background and, and what it was that you saw that started you into that path of getting into regenerative agriculture? Well, for me, I'll, I'll probably go back to when I was, my father asked me to go spray thistles and I probably would have been about, I don't know, 15 and the knapsack was bigger than what I was and when I started to spray the stuff, I just noticed there's more thistles coming up. Then after that, decided to use a hoe. And what got me was that where I used to go chop the thistles out, and you've got to go down about that deep to get the purple bit, I always found earthworms around where the thistles were. And then one day, for some reason, I chopped something somewhere else. And I realised that there were no worms. And I thought, well, that's a bit weird. I thought it must have worms everywhere, because everywhere I dug where the thistles were, there was worms. And slowly but surely, I started to realise it was the thistles who were actually producing the soil around the worms. And that was one of the triggers for me that got me to start to think about on a dairy farm, why am I actually trying to take out a plant that's the only plant that's actually producing the worms that I need to get the topsoil to get things going? So for me, that was a big trigger. With, with the NSF, it was 2006 drought. Um, I've been consulting for many years. I run my own consultancy business. Um, I was on probably you call it a national circuit. Um, PA was with that one, Christine Jones, Martin uh, Stapper. And uh, Peter turned around after a couple of times I caught up with him and said, look, do you want to come up to Jerry's place? And um, so he started teaching me and I had spent five days with PA up there. But this whole NSF stuff is so important. It's, it's a missing, it's like the chapter that's missing in agriculture. And I think what's happened is that we've come from a situation where we had the Australian Constitution was set up after the Federation drought, then we've ended up with people sort of saying, oh, water's important, and, and yes, it is, but there's a lot more we need to understand it. There's a daily water cycle, there's a biotic pump, there's a heap of stuff that we're still trying to get our hands around it. Yeah, so I think out of the, you know, with your journey into the NSF, um, all of your learnings. What do you think is the the thing that that um, you wanted to share with 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 you know in terms of your your learnings around that? Is it was it it was it a, a process of slowly understanding um, um, the way nature worked, or was it was it you know your own experience of of being a farmer yourself, or what was that 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 thing that we just I just wanted to let you know that our audience is very broad, so um, I think they'd be fascinated to know about that NSF you know, that aspect of it? For me, water is life. Um, as an agronomist, um, whether my best soil clients or my worst soil clients, if they've got no water, guess what they've got? Nothing. Um, and that's where this focus on water has got to come back. We, we, we're moving towards desertification in Australia, to be quite blunt. Um, there's they call the Great Southern Migration, which is the weeds from up north coming down south. It's not the weeds coming that way it's the fact the environment's drying out and the weeds are simply just following it along. Um, from my perspective, I think the thing that I try and understand with NSF and weeds and probably one of my strengths is is looking at plant succession because all plants are in a succession. So when we start thinking about um, weeds, personally with NSF concepts, I tend to say, well, don't class it as a weed, class it as a plant. Because a weed, really, what's happening is that you're making a decision that it's got a negative value. And this is the whole crazy thing that it's still a plant. It's still working in a plant succession. And also, a lot of the weeds we're finding have actually got a positive feedback loop. In other words, they're there for a reason, and they're actually raising the successional order. Whether we want them or not, that's our decision. Yes, yeah, so, Gwen, if you were to... Um 
If you were to think about what sort of a weed you are, what would you call yourself? I'm like a soft brome because I've had to be when I've been working with um, the Andrews and people because, yeah, I'm, I'm the oil on the chain. <laughs> so if that, weed, if that weed shows up in the paddock, what does that, what's that indicating in the soil? Um, in that situation, trying to, um, I'd like to try and get the fertility a little bit higher. I come from the Western District with a, with a dairy background, so I'm, my peak sort of plant's moving towards ryegrass, so I'd like something in it with a bit more protein in it. <laughs> well, Mike, I might ask you then if that's okay. What sort of a what sort of a weed are you? <laughs> when we were talking about this and we were talking about you know blackberries and thistles, and I said, well, I, I don't know, um, maybe uh, maybe a farmer's friend, you know, first one in there to try and repair the the soil, you know, um, and. It, Farmers uh, realise, you know, where they spray around their sheds and um, that's where the farmer's friends come back. You know, they're really trying to dump the sugars into the soil to get the soil going again after we've killed it with chemicals. So. Helen's talking without being unmuted. Yeah, you're on mute, Helen. <laughs> Yeah, I just uh, just because I've been in this journey of regenerative agriculture and it's fascinating the successional plants and um, I don't know, Mike, if you wanted to talk about that. That soil brings through different weeds and uh, different um, you know successional uh, depending on the soil. Did you want to share that, or Stuart? Who wants to take up that question? I'm happy to take it. <laughs> oh, Gwyn, sure. So one of the things is what you've got to think about, and just very briefly, is you start off at a low succession, you've got a rock, and the next one that comes in is like a lichen and a moss, which don't have roots. Then you end up with the smaller plants that are coming in with small um, sort of fibrous roots. Then eventually we can get to a taproot. Then we start to get taller, we get the grasses coming through, you get the forbs coming through. And slowly as the plants start to increase in height, the one thing I want you to think a little bit about is it's not just the fact that they're producing more carbon in the soil, which they are, but they're actually changing a biosphere. They're actually making a little home for themselves. So that moss is actually holding that moisture. Then that plant can go down and get a little bit deeper soil. Then over time, you'll find that you'll go to a bush, then you'll go to a shrub, and then eventually start to move towards a forest. So that successional concept's fairly well documented. The challenge is when we start to think about when that degenerative process happens, when we actually start to deal with this issue of climate change and these plants actually start to die out. So the successional order going up is a productive order. Each higher succession is more productive than the normal one from a biomass point of view. But what is actually happening is that when the successional order starts coming back down, we start to find that the plants become less productive and more protective. So a typical example of that one is that if people have overgrazed, the plants that are being taken out are the ones that are the ice cream, and the ones that are tough, the ones that are high in silica, the ones that are toxic, the ones that are thorns, are starting to replace it. And the plants are there as guardians to some degree. And if you can start to understand the form and the function of each of those weeds, then you can actually work out where you are in that plant successional order, and also which way you're heading. So. I use the term pastures tend to tell you where you are. Weeds tell you where you're going, whether you're going forward or whether you're going backward. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the Australian landscape is going backwards. So we're seeing these more um, protective plants coming in. We're seeing cactus migrating down and people saying the cactus is coming into the region. No, the environment's degraded. And now the environment's degraded, the plant is simply reflecting it. So... If you think about a weed as an indicator plant and ask yourself, what's it indicating? Then if you want to be a little bit exotic and crazy, you may say, well, is it a repair plant? Does it have a role? And a lot of weeds do have a role in the repair plants because they're actually trying to raise the successional order back to where they are. And lantana and blackberry bushes, we forget the word bushes, because one of the key things when we talk about desiccation is that bushes are an indication of desiccation. So think about a bush, you've got, a, sh you've got um, a smaller plant, it's covering the ground, it often has better quality soil underneath it, 
It's got sprigs, in other words, it's sort of multi-stemmed, so the animals can't get into it. And that's an indicator of sort of desertification. So when people start saying, I'm getting lantana coming in, think about what's the soil underneath. Think about with blackberry. It's there for a reason. Gwen, I think that's, I think that your, um, I saw that article that you wrote and it was called The Need to Read the Weed. Yes. <laughs> and, and this is the thing. I think that as farmers, we go out and we just spray, 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 spray. And we're actually really, this, this knowledge is really key in regenerative agriculture. Absolutely key. Because if you don't know, if you don't know what the weed is and, and what, what, what the weed's actually doing to repair the soil, then you keep on doing the same thing with the same results. You, you do, but you do start to slip down. Like, I've got a lot of time for Stuart Hill. If you can ever get hold of Stuart Hill, get hold of him. He's, he's fantastic. And Stuart just says a very simple concept. He said, if you take the plant out, just remember you now have to do its role. And that one's a pretty big eye-opener. Um, from my background, I ran Australia's first ever organic conversion course nearly 20 years ago. And when we did our preliminary surveys for that, for the dairy farming, which helped set up dairy industry up there, is mastitis was number one, and number two was what? Weeds. And if you go to deal with a lot of farming groups, in the top sort of five issues, weeds is coming up in that top section. Technically, it should be water coming up as number one, but we've still got a long way to work on that one. But people are feeling very confronted. But in actual fact, as we're dealing with a degraded landscape, the actual protective nature of these plants coming through is starting to dominate. And, you know, I've done field days. We've ended up with 65 people and Biosecurity Australia there and everybody's dog there. Once we start talking about the plant succession and we start moving off this issue of how do we kill it, the, the question is, what is the environment that the weed is in and can we change the environment? And that's when NSF comes in to try and raise that successional order. So with just a very simple concept, if I've got two bits of dirt, could be garden, could be whatever it is, if I've got the right conditions for a single uh, weed seed to grow, it will grow. If I've got a million seeds in the wrong condition, that plant in the wrong condition is not going to grow. So that's supporting what Stuart um, always said, is that, you know, when we try and take out the weed because we want to try and get rid of the seed burden, it's not the seed burden we're worried about, it's the environment. Change the environment and then the plants will change. So we've got to focus back on this concept with NSF and water, is how can we regenerate, how can we renew this landscape? And part of the mental concept, which is a barrier, is that if we start thinking about, okay, I'm going to put in a contour, make life simple, what's the first thing that's going to come up on your banks? Wheat. And then if you get on to this whole issue of um, dieback. Okay, so can I go on a bit longer? I'm, I'm taking a oh, lot of time up. No, go go for it. This, well, we've got as much time as you need. Okay. So... Basically, is, is a Y. So your root system, you've got a root coming along and, the, and the, it splits in two. That's your fibrous root system. The other one you've got basically is a tap root going down. So what is happening is that a lot of people are wanting, particularly in a grazing situation, they're wanting the grasses. Now, Stuart says, and I think it's very wise in what he says there, is you can still have a monoculture of grass, different species. So what is often happening is that when you've gone and you've got the grasses, they'll actually build up the surface layer of the organic matter level, which is great, and building carbon is essential. But building carbon is a byproduct of the plants. Remember that one. So then when we're dealing with grasses that die out, and if we take Queensland with buffalo, what is the plants that come in? They stay, it's the weeds that come in. So you've gone from grass roots like this this literally has hit an ecological climax. You've actually got, when you've got dieback, you've got an ecological collapse. That's how serious it is. Then the tap-rooted plants are coming in and taking the nutrient from down deeper and bringing it on the top. They're starting that nutrient cycle. So if we take the word weed and we sit that to one side and we say, what's it indicating? A lot of the plants that are coming in are tap-rooted plants. Whereas previously we had the fibrous plants which are relatively, of the feeding is mainly on the top, and the next lot of plants that's come through. Then when you talk about woody weeds, 
Okay. So woody weeds mean you've got a bigger plant on the top with a bigger root system, remembering that 50% of the plant's underneath. It's actually pulling the nutrient down. It's got to go down into deeper ground to get more nutrient to cycle it up on the top. Now, the next thing, if you wanted to go a little bit further, is that when you've got a, prote a protective plant, so it's protecting the landscape, when it lands on the ground, if something was high in protein, it would break down fairly quickly. But when you get this coarser material landing on the ground, it takes a long time to break down. And that's a natural phenomenon because you actually want the organic matter sitting on the ground for an extended period of time. So it's a self-adjusting mechanism. So once you start to um, ask yourself, why is that plant there? And then say, is it an indicating of, what is it indicating? And I've got 14 different categories on those ones. And then start to say to yourself, okay, and, and take the word nitrate weeds. So if one message needs to come across very simply, you've a lot of the weeds that are do with land degeneration, but your nitrate weeds, your marshmallow, um, you know, stinging nettles and type, those type ones, it's when you've got too much nitrate in the ground. So what a typical example of that one here is you ended up with 2006 drought. I wrote a book called Better Farming coming out of that. Then we've gone through this drought. So when you're in a dry environment, the organic matter in the soil is still oxidising, it's still breaking down, but the biology can't take it up. So what happens when it rains is the soil has got a heap of nitrate sitting in there. So nature's response is to try and go through and make sure we've got a protective green scab over the top of it. And that's the role of the nitrate plants. Now, if you go and kill your nitrate plants and take them out, what's going to come back? More nitrate plants. So if you then think about pasture cropping, if you've got a high, if you're coming out of a drought and you've got a lot of nitrate sitting there, why can't you use a cereal to take the nitrogen up and make a dollar off of it instead of going it straight into nitrate weeds and trying to kill the mongrels? It's just a different way of thinking about it. It really is a, a different way of thinking about it, isn't it, Gwen? You know. Um my the farm that we're on was a farm that my grandfather owned and i sort of watched the way he managed the land and and you know the cattle he would put a number of cattle into a paddock and that was their paddock so you know he was a conservative farmer he used to stock conservatively but the cattle basically stayed in that paddock they might have moved sort of you know from maybe one paddock to another for their for their lifetime, and uh, you mentioned there before, you know that that uh, the first plant they go for is the ice cream and the chocolates, and you know the last ones they go for are the Brussels sprouts, and um, you know over time that landscape changes because when you keep biting, taking the the top off the ice cream, over time that plant gets weaker and weaker, and and eventually dies out, and. And that's, you know, when you talk about desertification, that's actually what's happening. The later sectional plants, which tend to be, you know, sweeter and higher in proteins, get eaten out first and, and it comes back to the, to the harder, uh, more protective plants because they're the last ones that the animals want to eat. And um, over time, that just develops a lot of bare ground. So, you know, when I first started farming, a lot of our pasture paddocks, um, you know, had a lot of thistles that would come up on that bare ground and they were trying to protect that ground. And yep. in grandfather's vernacular, they were weeds, but, you know, from nature's perspective, they were just trying to protect the, the ground. So, you know, as we learned more about, um, you know, how we manage the, the stock and how important that is, and we, we went to a, a planned grazing process where we where we bunched all the cattle together so we could control them really well as far as how long they stayed in a paddock. And, um, and, you know, when we first put them into some of these paddocks, the thistles and the really old dry cooler tie grass that no nothing wanted to eat, well, the, the stock density actually just pushed that down onto the ground and that got it laid down at least in a litter layer where it might sort of work in the soil. And, you know, so we were planning how long the stock were in the paddock and, and you know, uh, and then we'd move them onto the next paddock. The other thing we were planning was how long that paddock got to rest and recover. 
and so those plants could come back. And that made sure that the, that the plants that were classed in the ice cream and chocolate range got plenty of time to recover and rebuild their roots and, and open, the, open the ground up. And so, you know, there's a saying that goes around out there that says it's not the cow, it's the how. And I can certainly attest to that from my own experience of changing the, the way we manage the cattle and actually starting to see the pasture land um, regenerate and come back and get some of these sweeter uh, perennial grasses that we hadn't seen for years. Um, so we've got a very, very different pasture now and very few thistles come through because there's not very much bare ground in any of that either. But, you know, what sort of... Um, I'd like to, to throw to Stuart here a little bit because as I'd sort of changed my management, I realised there was a whole process going on underneath the ground in the, in the way water moved and the way water worked in the landscape. So, you know, I was one of the, the first people that sort of, as Peter started to, to share his wisdom, was, was all ears. Um, I couldn't say that I... I understand what he can see in the the landscape yet but uh you know Stuart growing up with with Peter you said it was really important actually going from just listening now to doing so can you share some of your experience when you actually had to take on the farm what you saw and and how some of what Peter talks about started to to lock into place for you yeah sure Mike thank you I was I was waiting to to jump in with Gwyn there when he was uh, giving his good description. Um, <clears throat> and he did say in early on, Gwyn, about, the, about water. And the key thing and the thing that, that everybody seems to have forgotten is how important hydrology is. And that's not rainfall. Don't think of it as rainfall. It is about hydrology. And how did this Australian landscape manage its water prior to the interference of any human? Aboriginals or white fellas, doesn't matter. Now, what it was able to do, it was able to create these series of steps and ponds. So the landscape was hydrated from the land above. It was also fed fertility from the land above. So the big open floodplain areas that we see today were all being fed by the hills that surrounded them, the mountain ranges that surrounded them. That's why those areas became so fertile. We seem to have forgotten that and in our dividing up of our landscape into paddocks or into, you know, land ownership titles, we just focus on what goes on in that piece of land. So we, we're, we're just thinking about the rainfall that falls and we're thinking the rainfall is going to fall, it's going to go into the ground, we're going to capture it, that's it. And we think that's as far as it goes. But no, that's not how this landscape evolved. The landscape evolved as one whole unit, not a series of divided up pieces of land that we have today. So what we need to do is we need to go out into the landscape and understand where were the parts where the recharge was taking place. In other words, the water was going into the ground, fertility was being built and captured, and then it was being distributed down to the lower land. Understanding the whole time there's one energy that's making this process happen, and that's gravity. And we get that for free. We don't have to pay for it. It's there 24 hours a day and it's either working for us or against us. So gravity would be carrying both the water and the liquid nutrients through the profile of the soil to feed all of the plants on the bottom side. So just have a draw a picture in your mind. I've, I think the easiest way to do any of this stuff is to go back out into your landscape and draw a picture, whether it's on your land or somewhere else. But if you imagine a pond of water and the pond of water is sitting slightly up the slope, that pond of water now is feeding everything below it. So if you see a dam, you can see on the bottom side of the dam, you'll see the plants are greener. As you get further away, it starts to dry out. Potentially right at the bottom of that, you might see a scalded area, and that tells you that you've got salt moving. That's all driven by that dam. But no one ever thinks about the dam as being... Uh, a, you know, a source that is driving the landscape. So what we need to do is we need to set up our landscape as it functioned before, and that is with these series of steps where water can pond, move through the profile of the soil, not so much over the top. It's only the excess that runs over the top. 
It moves through the profile of the soil. Whether you're on floodplains or on the side of a hill, doesn't matter. It still functions the same. The difference on a floodplain is you've got generally an aquifer in there which has a greater storage capacity. Once you move up onto the slopes, it's your clays. They become your aquifer. That's your storage. That's your bank. That's where you are storing your fertility and your water. But most times today, that doesn't even get wet because the water sheets across the top and so your aquifer or your storage area never gets filled. So that's when um, the sequence comes into place that Gwyn was talking about, where you start with a succession. So your succession would start if you had a step. On the bottom side of your step, you'll have your repair plants come in. Those plants are going to build the fertility to feed the landscape below it. The water that is captured in the pond behind becomes the mechanism to move the fertility. So if we have no water in our system and the water isn't stacked up in the landscape, it can't move the fertility, which means the fertility just stays in one spot. And so you get build-up of fertility rather than fertility moving down the slope as it once um, happened. And the trouble is, I think, as farmers or any of us, what you can't see is very hard to believe or to understand. But... Anyone can do this demonstration. We use this in our, in our training program where if you set up on a table and you get a whole heap of serviettes or something that can absorb a heap of water and you lay them out and then you set a pond. A pond could just be a dish. Grab a, a baking dish out of, your, out of the cupboard. Sit it on the table. Fill it with water. Then set some of your serviettes draped over the side so that it, as it transmits the water up and over and back onto the serviettes laid out on the table, then you watch what happens. And you'll see that the water is gradually moving. So those serviettes are replicating your soil, your high carbon soil, because you're building carbon as you go, more plants, more carbon, better the system is. So more organic matter. So that's representing the movement of the water through the profile of the soil. Now that's being fed by that pond sitting at the top. Add another part to it, add fertility. The fertility can come in the form of coffee grounds. So add a pile of coffee grounds where the water is coming out of the pond and watch how it's now distributed across through the landscape. That tells you everything you need to know. That's how a landscape functions. If you don't set it up like that, it's not functioning how it once did. Everyone can go home and practice that, do it on their table and see how it how it functions once they get that in their head they can then start to piece together how the landscape works so as Gwyn was talking about earlier about plants you know the the plants doesn't matter about all of their individual individual roles the key for plants is that if they are green and they are growing they are capturing the energy from the sun capturing carbon from the atmosphere and putting it into the soil all plants, all plants. Now, if the landscape is devoid of fertility, then you get the ones that are, like Wim was talking about, the deeper rooted, the tap rooted plants, bigger leaf matter, because they can capture fertility from the atmosphere. They don't require it necessarily from the soil. If they need it from the soil, then they can go deeper down than the grasses that are around them. They will build that fertility a lot faster than grasses. Grasses are exploiters. Grasses grow as a result of the fertility that was built by plants before them. No other way. And going back to your discussion about the cattle and how we manage the landscape, that is key. Cattle, sheep, any of the hard hoofed animals that we run today in this landscape, which I must tell you, if you don't already know, did not evolve in this landscape as it evolved. We introduce those animals into it so they are unfamiliar with this landscape, therefore potentially very damaging. And they do damage, if we don't manage them correctly, they damage these key bits of infrastructure where the ponds form to start this hydrological process. And that's what's really key, that we understand that. Our animals are definite tools that we need, but we also need to manage them and understand where they will perform the most amount of damage. Now, go back to your question, Mike, and you asked me about what my experiences were. When I took over running Tarwan Park, we ran horses. I would have to suggest that the horses weren't managed that well. PA will tell you he was doing an experiment. 
You can believe whatever you like. It doesn't matter. Either way, it was an experiment and it showed how things operate differently. We, as in Megan and I, changed from being a horse run property to being a cattle run property on a rotation. The horses were on a rotation of sorts, but it was a very poor one. And so the plants were simplified back to, you know, a lot of our repair plants, which were coming in to repair the damage that horses had done, whether it be compaction, overgrazing, whatever. Those plants were coming in. That's our repair mechanism. We must understand those plants are key to start the system. If we don't have them, we can never start the system again. The next thing I've realised is that if you're not careful with the way you manage your livestock, your cattle, your sheep, if you go out with a view that the vision I want is I want all grasses. If that's the vision you want, you will get it because the way you manage your animals, you will end up driving it to grass. But do you really want that? Now, this is the part that was really key for me is that I thought that's what I wanted until I got there and the landscape told me that wasn't what you wanted because the landscape was not able to be supported over a long period of time with just grasses. It must have diversity. You must have a series of these other plants coming in to rebuild the fertility that the grasses utilise as an exploiter plant. And unless you understand that, I think Gwyn mentioned it earlier, where if we drive our system to being a monoculture, you can have 10 species of grass. I don't care. That's a monoculture. That's all grass. If you drive it to that level, eventually it will fail. It's just a matter of when. It's already out there. Buffalo grass up here in Queensland is a prime example. That plant is very dominant. The way the grazing is conducted, it dominates even more, and then it crashes. You don't want it to crash because you can't afford it to. If it, go, if it crashes and it has to come back to all repair plants, you're not making any money. So it's key to understand that you, your, the thing you want to drive for is diversity. So you need some of those repair plants, whether you like it or not, in your system because they are rebuilding it. They are giving it that reboot, reboot for you so that you can continue to grow the plants that your animals desire more so they'll still nibble on all those others as well they're their medicine plants so they'll still utilize them but they just won't consume them all because they're coming in to, to do a role so they're some of the key lessons I, I think that i learned the hard way because i thought i was doing the right thing but it was only through doing it that i found out that it wasn't quite the right thing you know so you just got to be a little bit careful about what what you wish for and make sure you've got a clear image in your mind as to what you want to get to. Hopefully that answers a little bit of what you asked, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I'm going to jump in here because this is just such a fascinating discussion and I really want to touch on that word diversity. Um, diversity is like, you know, the diversity in the soil, the diversity in our landscapes. Um, Mike and I, Mike has just planted a 1,000 acres of multi-species um, and last week we went out um, and it was just such a joy to see because we were on the bike and all the birds flew out. There were ladybugs everywhere. It was just a thrive and the, the flowers are coming out. And the thing is right now we have, we have mice plague everywhere. You know, half an hour from us at Ashford, we've got mice everywhere. And Mike, you were planting yesterday and there are no mice. There are no mice. We don't have a mice plague. So, you know, that whole thing of, the, of nature being perfect as it is, it's just that in itself is like the thing. Mike, yeah, you want to... There's, there's, if you drive for diversity, you don't have to worry about all the other things, you know. If, and if you don't have diversity of plants, you cannot have diversity of biology in the soil. You know, if you don't have diversity of animals, it makes it very difficult to have diversity of plants. It means that you, you have to be a much better manager because you have to understand and be able to read your landscape a lot more clearly if you're just running a monoculture of animals. If you're just running cattle, then you have got a simple system and it's much harder to maintain the diversity of plants. But so long as you realise that the diversity of plants is the key... And then you can use those animals to try and achieve that as best you can. You know, we spend too much time uh, looking at soil 
where in actual fact, we don't need to spend that amount of time looking at soil. We just need to look at the plants that should be growing there because those plants are what's going to build your soil. Those plants in conjunction with the biology are going to create all of those changes that you're after. So, you know, what's, that's where it's really key with what Gwyn talks about is understanding the plants and why they're there. And all you have to do is come to terms with the fact that they're all doing good for you at that particular point in time, let them do their job and you'll end up getting to where you want to go. Outside of that, you're just fighting against everything. Can I just make a comment? Go ahead, Gordon. We're all here. <laughs> okay, so one of the challenges is when people are dealing with weeds is that if you understand the form and the function of what that weed is, are you able to put management practices in place so that you can actually move the succession to a higher order? So part of that issue is time compression. So a, a typical example would be, um, and I come from a dairy background, um, we've got stock on, we strip grazing, we've got a lot of stock in a small situation, and all of a sudden you get two inches of rain and they just pug the place out. You get surface sealing straight off bang. Now, with surface sealing, that's when the nitrate weeds tend to come in because the biology is not functioning down below. So in a daring situation, if that happened to me, we'd use a spiky roller to open up the soil fairly quickly because we only had 185 acres and we wanted to try and get it going. Um, so I'm raising that issue that plants have a role to play, but sometimes when you need to do time compression, if I want to use the term, you may have to use some form of intervention as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting if you start to open your mind and, and view things in a slightly different fa fashion because in a diverse ecosystem, as we've been speaking, every different plant has a different role. We've had in <clears throat> a couple of our pasture paddocks um, a plant that we call wild cotton come in and, you know, my dad's response to that was, oh, my goodness me, look at that. It's, a, you know, a woody weed. We, we need to be controlling that. We should get out and spray it. And um, what I discovered, you know, watching those plants was that they were actually a food source for the monarch butterflies. And, mm. and so I started to say to Dad, you know, maybe we haven't got a, a deficiency of, of uh, Roundup. Maybe we've actually got a deficiency of butterflies. So we've left them there for a little bit and uh, we've certainly brought that back into balance because this year I was driving through those same paddocks and the number of monarch butterflies was just extraordinary. I mean, hundreds of them. And so to me, that was actually a really nice natural response to biodiversity. And, you know, I believe that, you know, as those... Uh, you know, caterpillars feed on the plant, there will actually be some sort of natural balance comes back into play here. Um, you know, we can, we can observe and see where that goes and, and what our next management step may be. But, um, you know, I'm certainly happy to, to see the monarchs back and being fed. Yeah, it's, it's just been a ama an amazing season for us, um, you know, with, with all of the the management tools that we've we've used and all credit to you Mike because it has been amazing going out after such a terrible devastating drought to come out of it and just see so much abundance you know I think about last week um, was I was talking to Dylan who helps us on our farm and he we've got he's got a horse and and anyway, the horse. He said to me, "Helen, I can't find the poo. I don't think the, I, I don't think the horse is pooing." And anyway, it turns out that we've got so many um, of the little um, dung beetles. The dung beetles. The dung beetles are eating the poo as quickly that you can't even see it. And not only that, we've got green frogs that are around the edge, starting to eat the dung beetles. So, like, this is such a beautiful thing. You think about the CSIRO who is spending millions of dollars creating dung beetles and all we needed to do was just create a thriving environment for them to just turn up. So this is just nature is so incredible that we can go through a, a drought. I mean, I haven't, I haven't, you know, even over the, the period of the drought before that, I hadn't heard 
one frog, you know, that devastation of not even being able to hear the frogs. And then all of a sudden it rains and we hear a croaking frog. Like, how does that happen? Like, how does that happen? So it's just a, a, a mystical, magical nature that we are working with, definitely. And I probably now is a good time. This I've got three beautiful um, videos of, of um, one of them's from Gwen and just some, some um, videos of, of the beauty of how important weeds are. So if we could show those, that would be great. Thanks, Biggie. I think a couple of things happen. One, <clears throat> don't panic about the thistles. I, my neighbour across the road had a great experiment two years ago. They sprayed a patch and then they ran out of chemicals. So they did half the paddock and didn't do the rest. They killed all the thistles and carrot weed and all the other things they were trying to kill then and they all disappeared. And the next year, guess where they came back again? They came back where they'd killed them and where they'd let them go, they disappeared. So cycles they will cycle themselves out. Um, generally, if I've got thistles or carrot weed or any of those deep-rooted um, annuals coming up, I know that I've overgrazed the paddock and created a situation for them to germinate, and they will come in, do their process, and then go out of the system. So they just kind of disappear on their own? They disappear. And I, we, we, the last experiment we did was in 2003. As I said before, I used to be a chemical um, and I got paid to go around killing weeds and I had some chemical left in the shed and in the middle of the drought we had a bit of a, um, a, a wet period came back in and I had a whole lot of paddocks that I'd chewed bare so <coughs> rather than throw the chemical out I got a contractor in to come and spray and we only had enough to do one paddock so we sprayed one paddock with the, the MCPA amine to kill flat weeds, thistles and we didn't do the other three paddocks that we sowed. And the first year, the one we sprayed, you saw these lovely green lines of the grasses we'd plant came up and it all looked pretty and everything. Um, and the ones that we didn't spray were a mess. There were thistles and carrot weed and all sorts of weeds coming up and you could hardly see what we'd sown. The next year, the ones that we hadn't sprayed, the grasses came back better. And the third year, they were fantastic. And the one we had sprayed came back for weeds for about five years. So initially it looked great where we'd sprayed, but within one or two years that one had gone backwards and was still trying to recover and the ones that we hadn't sprayed were just spectacular. So and when you come back to the serrated tussock, <coughs> I've got a, a property I bought it was nearly 100% serrated tussock and, and it was onto the block of uh, stuff I had <coughs> and I bought it to get rid of the serrated tussock there and initially I didn't know what to do and I talked to all my friends and they said eventually, oh listen, just spray it uh, to try and get the weed inspector off your back and go down that process. Now unfortunately I did do that and 
exactly as Peter would tell me would happen happened. Yes, we killed the serrated tussock and I've got some photo um, things here that show it all. The first thing that came back were the flat weeds and the second thing that came back were thistles and other big weeds and then the third thing that came back was serrated tussock. And the last thing to come back, it take, takes five to seven years with the native grasses and that. So I made a situation there where the weeds had a kick start for seven years and now we're seven years later we're trying to get back to get the um, the good competitive grasses because if you look at this one that's got kangaroo grass growing up through it and that one there's got microlina growing through it the native grasses will out compete serrated tussock but flopurinate the chemical they use for killing serrated tussock will kill serrated tussocks um, well they won't come back for seven years after you sprayed it serrated tussock will come back three years after so you, you're creating a lovely environment for serrated tussock by spraying. Yeah, so what do you think, guys? We've been talking about um, the different roles of plants in nature and, and how, in fact, from a natural perspective, there is no such thing as a weed. That just becomes our view of things in our management process and learning to to work with nature. When I was talking before about changing the, the way we move the cattle around the landscape and, and, and making the, the pastures more diverse and, and thickening up so there was no bare ground, you know, one of the things that I saw in that was um, all of a sudden the rainfall was actually going into the soil instead of running off and filling up our dams. And in the first little bit I had to you know manage the water fairly carefully but I, I figured that was a good thing now because it was in the soil rather than running off and if you think about that bare soil is a bit like a tin roof you know and so we get this rainfall that that all runs straight into the creeks and down the rivers and runs at speed and does a lot of damage to the to the riverine environment itself and so I think um you know, in natural sequence farming or in some of that discussion, there was a talk about, you know, slow the flow. Um, and when we get ground cover there, now we slow the water down and a lot of it goes in. And, you know, when we were messaging in Carbonate around, you know, how important carbon in the soil is and how this impacts the whole drought process and you know, well-structured soil rich in carbon holds a lot more water. And I remember back to doing a, a property planning thing and CSIRO had done a study somewhere and somebody had come out with a figure to say that farmers were only, Australian farmers were only 21% efficient with the rainfall that we received. And I thought that's pretty extraordinary in one of the driest continents on the earth and we're only 21% efficient in our water use. And that sort of got me looking into this whole aspect of holding it in the soil and, and what happens there. And um, I'm aware, you know, some work that Gabe Brown did where when his soil uh, was only around that sort of 1% soil carbon, the most rainfall that could move into that soil was about two inches over an hour. And, you know, sometimes we can get big storms where we might get, you know, two inches in 15 minutes or half an hour. So most of that water is running off. When he did the same sort of measurement, when the soil got up to about 8% uh, soil carbon, that same soil could take in 32 inches an hour. So that means that we could get our whole rainfall in one hour and it would all go into the soil, which I thought was just extraordinary. And if we extrapolated this out, this water holding capacity, I worked out, you know, we've got a local dam here, Copeton Dam, and it's quite a large dam. And um, I worked out that if we took just in the, in the shires below that dam, if we lifted the soil carbon from 1% up to 8% across that agricultural region, we would actually hold the same amount of water in the soil that was sitting in the dam. And so that to me was just extraordinary. Um, so, you know, I hear about um, how water can go into the soil 
And I know with natural sequence farming, this stepped approach, it's, it's hard to understand because it's happening out of our view. And, and I can see that if we get the soil, the water into the soil, then this, the water will move through the soil. But I, I really want to know how this links to our river systems, you know, because our rivers in, in the drought just go dry. And I'm sure they didn't go dry before because the fish wouldn't have survived some of the huge droughts we had, you know, around the turn of the century and things like that. So what was the system that was working there naturally? Well, a, num a number of things have happened, you know, in the last 200 odd years and to some degree even prior to that. Our rivers have been sized. So our rivers never were the deep channels that we see them as today. And it's interesting because because we, you know, we came from England, we came with a drainage paradigm. So what, is, what has happened is we, we, for a start, we call all of our rivers, our creeks, our flow lines are all drainage lines. So that automatically says to you, you want to drain the landscape. Well, we've done a very good job of doing exactly that. So as good a job as you do out on your landscape with uh, managing your plants and, and building carbon, because gravity is still working against you in some ways, that water that you get stored in the ground is still moving to the lowest point. The lowest point in most cases is that river system or the creek or the gully. So then that's now your limiting factor. So that is now going to carry away all of the good work you did in the surrounding landscape. So, and there's another part to that as well, is that drought, Australia is known for its droughts. That's not going to change. You know, it's, it's been like that for a long time. So we go through these series of dry periods. Droughts are probably something that we've caused in the way that we've farmed, but dry, dry times are a part and parcel of, of this particular landscape. The thing is that we go through those dry times, and this last one, um, you know, for good parts of Queensland and, and New South Wales and probably Victoria as well, have been quite severe. We all know that. And even the really, really good managers struggled to keep good ground cover. And so, you know, this is where the landscape was able to take over beforehand because it would go through these series, but it would not allow that water to escape, even if it made it to the flow lines, it would create these series of ponds so it would slow down the speed that the water and the fertility could leave your landscape gave it more time to soak out because as the landscapes dry generally what happens is we go through these periods of it's drought fire which has become more prominent in the last little while and flood that's the succession that that's happened through time and so generally what happens is flood follows the drought and so the flood usually comes the rain, unlike this year. This year, I think we were probably a little bit lucky where we got gentle rain rather than dramatic big storms. But most times a drought breaks with big rain events. And so our landscape is vulnerable. Uh, if we've made a choice to keep animals on, which, you know, a lot of people still do that, then our landscape's deteriorated even further so that we lose all that water. That water ends up in our rivers, our flow lines, creeks, whatever, and runs away. With it goes our fertility. Pardon me for interrupting, but you said the rivers are in size. So what I'm seeing out there now, these really deep river channels, are you saying that the landscape didn't look like that? Never. No way. That's part of what we do in our training course. We take people out and we teach them how to read the landscape, how it used to be. The pattern is still there. PA uses this analogy. He says the landscape is like a dinosaur, a dinosaur's skeleton. So what, what he does and what I do and anybody else that's able to do this, which is a learned thing, it's not something that you necessarily naturally are able to do. Well, PA probably was, but I had to learn it. And that is that you go out in the landscape and you can look around and you look for pieces. Quite often you can find the dinosaur's head and you can find the dinosaur's foot, but you can't find the rest of it. So what you've got to do is piece it back together. So by doing the things that we talk about where you put a contour in, you link back, say, the dinosaur's head with its foot or whatever so that you're joining that landscape back together. And once you do that, you can see how the landscape used to work. 
prior to the incision or even the movement of our creeks and rivers. A lot of them have moved. If you go onto a, when I go out onto a floodplain system, you can look and see and determine whether the today's river is running in the same position that it was running 200 odd years ago. And you can, you can know that by looking across the floodplain, you can look to see whether the, whether the land on that floodplain rises up to the river or goes down to the river. If the floodplain goes down to the river, then it's a new position. If the landscape actually goes up to the river, then that's the original position. Now, most people can't grasp that concept that the creeks actually, or the rivers actually ran on the highest part of the landscape, not the lowest part of the landscape. And it was plants that enabled that to happen over a long period of time, which is why we're on here and we're talking about plants and all plants because they're so key and so important because they are the managers of the landscape, not us, not our animals, plants and plants only. And as long as we get that firmly in our head and realise that they are the rulers and they can do everything we need them to do, then we are going to move in the right direction. What we need to do as land managers or land stewards is we need to assist the plants to be there. That's what we need to do. So what we talk about in NSF, we've got these now eroded systems, systems that have been the, the drainage lines or whatever have cut deeper and or moved. We need to reconstruct those because so they can be in series of ponds and then our surrounding landscape gets linked back to those channels and rather than referring to the river or the creek as being something completely removed from the rest of the landscape, they become one again. So the dinosaur skeleton is actually coming back together. At the moment, it's all separated and it can't possibly work. And so that's why this information is so powerful. And the, the sad part is, as humans, we don't look at this first. We look at the landscape and we say, oh, I'm going to buy that piece of land over there and I'm going to run cattle. But you never asked the landscape. Never once did you ask the landscape whether it was capable of running cattle or whatever it might be. It doesn't matter. Cropping doesn't matter. And so the, you know, the information that Gwen was talking about with plants, you use that as part of your assessment. You can look at that. The plants will tell you what it's capable of doing at this point in time today. And that determines where you start. Where, and, and then if you start looking at the hydrology, you fix that first. Then you can start to build a landscape so you may end up getting to where you want to go rather than starting at a place where you shouldn't be to begin with. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, um, Stuart, I'm just really loving hearing about how we really need to observe our landscape and not just not just once every now and again. Um, and for those people who are, you know, from the city and they're not farmers, you can do that too. Like if you've got a, local, a little local waterway or a creek or a river, um, it's been really interesting. I've actually been taking my kids down. I've got four kids and I've been taking them down for a swim every day for the last two weeks. And, um, you know, I actually, in the past, when my kids were little, we used to go swimming in our river and it was always the same level. Even if we didn't have rain, it was always the same level because the, all the springs were really healthy. But now because we've had the, dr the drought, um, what's happened is that, you know, our, our springs and our aquifers have really suffered. They've taken a big toll. And, you know, over the last week we've seen the river really high and then flowing. And then yesterday we went and it was hardly flowing. And normally, you know, it, those aquifers and those um, springs, the groundwater, the underground groundwater should be holding that steady. And that's not happening. So us observing that and knowing that, as farmers, you know, if you're an irrigator and you're observing your, the river and what's happening, everyone now needs to really see, you know, open their eyes and see what's going on around them because if we lose the, the health of the rivers, that's an indication that we've, lose, we've lost losing our underground water, an indication that we're not looking after our landscapes. And so we need to have a different, you know, we need to really look, take a different look really look with our eyes and real and our senses to see what's going on in the landscape. 
Yeah, just going back to, to what Mike mentioned earlier, and he talked about where he, where he talked about the rivers lowering and and that you know rivers are running dry, where the the view is that the rivers are always running water because of the fish and so forth. But that wasn't actually the case. The Murray River would run dry, but it would it would form into a series of ponds. Now the water hadn't stopped moving. The water was still moving. You just couldn't see it. So the pond, you could see, but there was still water moving through underneath. So the water in those ponds was still okay because there was water moving through the profile of the soil. That kept it oxygenated, kept it clean and, and working well. Since then, our rivers have incised and now they have water in them for longer. Some of that's due to the infrastructure that's been put in, big dams that, you know, do releases and whatever for irrigation. Once again, thinking about the river as just a drain. It's just a conduit to send water to pump it somewhere else rather than being a linkage with the entire landscape. Where these rivers were much shallower and they would dry up into series of ponds, but those ponds were windows into the landscape, which said to you, yes, there's now only a pond there, but the surrounding landscape is running at that level. So that water is all out in the landscape. Now instead, it's all in the river, but it's only in the river for a week and it's gone to the ocean. We never get it back. You know, it's a complete change around. So what we need to get back to is we need to be able to hydrate our surrounding landscape so that our rivers do run for longer. Then we need to get our rivers functioning so that they're in these series of steps, these ponds, so that we, if they do dry back, they dry back with these ponds, which are the with the... the reservoir for our fish and all of our aquatic life so that they can be maintained in there there's a there is a big job to be done but it's not that difficult to do we just have to have the will and the knowledge and so you know what we've tried to do in town park training is to give to the knowledge to those who need it the most and that's the guys who are managing their landscape because not only are they going potentially backwards with their production system and, and financially, their landscape's going backwards, which is affecting everybody. So if we can get farmers empowered to know how they can fix this themselves, not have to pay for someone else to do it and not have to spend a lot of money. PA uses this line all the time. If you are spending a lot of money to do this, then you are doing it wrong. And that is really key. It should not be costing you a lot of money. This landscape built all by itself with no one, with no money, nothing. It just built itself with the plants, the water, and managing the energies that come as a result. So we have energy that comes in for good or harm. And the determining factor is our management of the landscape as to which one it is. So currently we make our landscape devoid of plants, whether it be through, you know, spraying, ploughing, overgrazing, doesn't matter. So now we can't even harness the energy from the sun. We can't harness the energy from the sun. We can't possibly capture carbon and store it in the ground. We get rainfall coming and because we don't have the plants, the rainfall runs off. So now we've got gravity beating us. So gravity is carrying away our fertility and our water. You manage those two energies You've got it solved. It's as simple as that. It's so, so simple. And I think that's part of the problem and part of the frustration probably for PA over all these years is that the message is so simple. People go, nah, can't be that easy. Well, it is. Stop and think about how it works. It is that darn easy. And go back to what you talked about in the veggie garden. You can create this same thing in the veggie garden. You can build a pond system at the top a contour system all the way down and your vegetables grow and they're fed by that pond. You just built the Australian landscape in your backyard. It all works the same. It is just so simple, so simple. I mean, we shouldn't really even have to go out and teach anybody. You should just know this stuff, but we do have to teach it because people don't know it and they don't have that ability to read the landscape. They see stuff, but they don't really know what it means. And so that's what we're trying to do, make that make sense. When they look out there, I mean, I drive around everywhere. I can just drive along and I can read the landscape as I go. It becomes so easy once you get a handle on what to look for. But it's just getting that starting point to, to help you start to look. Yeah. Anyway, look, it's pretty simple. I, 
it, I just probably starting to get it, um, you know, a little bit frustrating for me at times too when, when people are struggling to look at this stuff and I think it's so simple and go back to, your, you know, what we talked about earlier and the plants and, and, you know, what sort of plant are you? Well, I'm the blackberry. I listed myself as a blackberry. PA, I listed down as the African boxthorn. If anyone knows an African boxthorn, it's got a massive thorn on it that when it pricks you, it gives you blood poisoning. Well, that's PA. That's what he'll do, but that's what a pioneer needs to do. You know, the blackberry's got slightly you know, smaller thorns, still pricks you, or could be a prick, whatever you want to call it. And But, you know, it's building the system. And then as it goes down, and Mike's listed himself as a farmer's friend, which is a fantastic plant, captures a heap of carbon. But you have all of these plants coming into the system to build it and build our landscape from, from the bottom right to the top. So... You know, we see our landscapes dying and we think, oh, it is, it's terrible, but we can fix it. It can all be fixed. The plants will do it for us, but we haven't got time to wait like Wynne talked about. You know, we need to be able to help them. And Stuart Hill talks about if you're going to remove a plant, then you have to be prepared to do its job. That's it. If you're prepared, if you want to remove that plant, then you have to be prepared to do its job. No other question. That's it. So for all those people who, who run around doing what they believe is good work, removing certain plants out of the system to build it, but they don't replace it. They don't put another plant in that can do that same job. I'll give you an instance. So willows, certainly down your way, willows are a very controversial plant. PA loves willows. I love willows. They are a fantastic plant. But it doesn't mean you're setting the landscape up to only, grow, only have willows. The landscape is just there having a pioneer plant that can handle the conditions that we have created in our farming practices. The willow is one of those plants that can do that, but it doesn't stay there forever. And this is something that I wouldn't have known either, except for the length of time that we were at Tawan Park, that in that 30 or 40 years that we were there, I saw the succession from willows to the native plants. So for all those guys are out there who have got a love for native plants, I have no issues with you there, but you've got to realise that the conditions that those native plants evolved under are not here today. We have destroyed that. So we must start with plants that are capable of building the system back to the point that those plants can now grow. And on Tawan Park, I saw casuarinas, the river she-oak, growing up over the top of the willows and taking the willow's light, and then the willow dies. The willow gets sick and gets attacked by grubs, and it's decomposed. Bang, there you go. You've just created that, but that poor old willow tree, who is generally a very much hated plant, did that. But it took 30 or 40 years to achieve it. Guess what? We want to see results tomorrow. Sorry, doesn't happen. We've got to be prepared to wait. All of these plants can take time to do it, but they're all working in a positive way to get there. We just have to be able to open our mind to realise that that's the way it's working and then work within it. Don't work against it. Stuart, that is just such phenomenal information. Um, and I think we have to do this again, definitely. We'll have to have a part two. So before we go, uh, Stuart, would you like to share with our audience how everyone can get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. Um, you can go on to our, our website, which is um, tawanparktraining.com.au. So you, you go on to there and, and you can read about what we do in our training program. If you're interested in attending a course, you can sign up through the through there. It's all set up. Our oldest son, Hamish, he's our IT man, so he's been able to set all of that up for us. Um, yeah, it's, um, we, we originally we started our training courses just at Tawan Park, but we left there back in 2014, 15, 14, I think it was. Um, and so when we were there running the training programs, people would say, oh, can you come to my area? Can you come to my area? Can, can you come to my area? And we sort of go, oh, no, we can't. It's difficult because it's, a, you know, it's about building a reputation, I guess, so so when you go to someone's area, you're actually going to get someone to attend the course. The other part is that I have to be able to know enough to go to a landscape that I've never seen before to run a course 
that's valuable for those people because I'm not interested in doing something that isn't going to be of value. And so I had to reach the point where I was able to, once again, I had to reach the point where I was capable of running a course, then I had to reach the point where I was capable of running a course anywhere. And it is different. You go all over the landscape and, and there's different landscapes everywhere, so you have to be able to do it. Anyway, now we do it. So this year we've got courses running in Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia and Western Australia. So we are getting about. And so, you know, we may well come to a town near you at some stage. And if anyone wants to run a course, you don't have to ring me. Say, listen, I'd like to run a course on our place. I believe we've got a good representative of people around here that would want to attend. And I just go, no problem. We'll lock in a date. When, whatever the best time of year is, we'll lock in a date. Let's advertise it and promote it and see if you reckon you're right, you get the numbers, we'll run the course, you get enough people, we'll run it. No problem. I'll go anywhere. doesn't matter. Is this information is really, really important and it's a pity that it's taken so long to get it out there. And I don't want that to take any longer because, you know, people need this information so that they can start to, you know, build their landscapes. Thank you, Stuart. That's just um, for your passion and your dedication to, the, to, you know, all of this work. It's just such a tribute to you and what all of you and your team are doing. So thank you very much. That's just awesome. Um, no Gwyn, what about you? Um, have you? Is there any way that people can contact you? Yeah, you can go gjones at healthyag.com. And if you want to send out that need to read the weed, I think that's a good starting point. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, Doesn't... thanks very much, everybody. What, a, what an awesome discussion. I think it's been very helpful uh, helping farmers and consumers alike, you know, start to get a better understanding of, of what it means to manage the Australian landscape and how important that is. So, yeah, um, thanks for coming. It's been an awesome, awesome time. There's one other thing I'd like to say before we go, because your audience is probably quite broad, for those people that are not farmers out there, that are people that eat food, <laughs> you need to realise that you're the guys that have all the power. Because of what you, how you purchase your food, that determines how farmers run their landscape. So if you determine that you want to eat quality food produced on a, on a, call it whatever you like, but on a regenerative farm, then you have to be prepared to pay a little bit extra because quite often it costs a little bit more to run that operation. But that encourages more farmers to then farm that way. You have all the power. The poor old farmer, he is just doing what he can to survive and produce the food in the best way he can. And to support him, you must buy quality products. I can't stress that more. It's so important. Wonderful. Well, that's what National Region Ag Day is all about, um, healing the heart of our food chain. So, guys, that is literally the most silent I've ever been on a podcast. I actually did not say one word. It was a fantastic amount of information, so inspiring. I can't wait to follow this up with the NRAD audience and really push your course, Stuart, and Gwen, your documents, there's so much information there. It's going to be a pleasure to get behind you guys and really push our audience into alignment with, with all the work you're doing. So thank you so much for being on this amazing podcast. Real privilege. We've got the NRAD coming up on Saturday for our yearly event celebrating regenerative agriculture and all that it means with a particular focus this year on sacred regeneration and healing our river and waterway system. So with that, Helen, I think we're a wrap. And um, we will see everyone very, very soon with our next broadcast tomorrow morning. So thank you, everyone, and enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, guys. See you, Stuart. See you, Gwen. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nicola. And I'm Darren. And we are from Nutrisoil. We are part of a team whose purpose is to empower farmers to produce life-enriching food. Here at Nutrisoil, we produce a unique worm liquid which farmers use to coat their seed in furrow and as a foliar application. This in turn increases the light capture of plants, 
and the abundance and diversity of life in the soil. Food grown in this system has higher nutrient integrity, uses less fertiliser and has a less chemical load, which is healthy for humans and the earth. We're thrilled to be silver sponsors of the National Regenerative Agricultural Day, celebrating sacred regeneration of the earth.